let's go to uh, the Gospel of Mark. And uh, the text I want to read here is verse 10. Haven't you read the passage of Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Father God, we just ask that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your word today. And Lord, I ask that there would be an open heaven between uh, me and these people. Lord, that there would be revelation come straight from your throne room, straight to their heart. And by the end of this service, may everybody be able to say, it has been well, it has been good to be in the house of the Lord. So Father, I ask you to help me to preach today. Hide me behind the cross. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. The controversy stories. Um, in this chapter, uh, Mark is, is, is telling the narrative here, uh, and, and he's writing to his Roman uh, believers. And if you've got to remember that the context of, of how uh, Mark was written, it was probably written right after Peter was crucified upside down and, and Paul was beheaded by Nero. And so Mark, uh, who was the interpreter of Peter, uh, felt led by the Holy Spirit to sit down and begin to write out the gospel. And we know from the internal evidence that probably this was the first gospel that was written because all of the internal evidence as, as the other synoptic gospels, Matthew and Luke, basically contain the gospel of Mark inside of it plus additional material. Matthew is more written for the, the, the Jews, and Luke is written more for the Gentiles. And uh, uh, it, in the Luke, there's more references to the Holy Spirit, there's more references to Gentiles, and more references to women in the book of Luke. And Matthew uh, contains basically all the book of Mark, but it has more references to prophecy prophecy fulfilling it so we come here and this is last week uh, we did a switch over from topical to chronological we're heading towards the passion week the last week of Jesus's life and Jesus is ramping up uh, controversies and opposition to the Pharisees and to uh, the Sadducees the scribes and the temple authorities and also we find out in the Herodians. And so what's the difference between those is the Pharisees were like your uh, super Republicans, almost uh, alt-right kind of guys. They were just really there. And then the Sadducees were on the other side. They were like your really progressive Democrats. And then your Herodians were those who followed Herod. And they mixed a little Judaism in. But they were very political, and the Sadducees were very political. The Pharisees were not political. And then the scribes and the temple authorities were all, um, all about, uh, you know, following uh, and running the temple and maintaining their power. So Jesus was going and leading up to a conflict here. The remaining of this chapter uses a form of the controver controversy story. There's the miracle form, where there's a miracle a description of the scene. There's usually a description of the problem, and then the miracle itself. And then there's usually proof that the miracle actually occurred. And then there's an acclamation from the onlookers. And then there's the form of pronounce, pronouncement stories. There's the simple structure. Everything in the story leads to some pithy state uh, saying or aphorism. And at the end, which controls the author's decision about what is, uh, is he should include or leave out, which is a way of a punchline that controls a humorous decision about to include a what um, to leave out of a joke. In other words, in the, in the story that we just read, I just read you the punchline uh, and about the tenants and the, and the landowner. And uh, he says, it all leads up to this. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And the Lord has done it, and it is marvelous in our eyes. That's the punchline. There's two, three types of uh, pronouncement stories. 
And I'm sure you won't remember this the moment you get out to your car today, but I'm going to tell you anyway. There's the biographical, the scholastic dialogue, and the controversy dialogue. And we are in the controversy dialogue. These are controversy stories. So let's start here, and I'm going to read through uh, I'll quickly through the whole chapter, not all at once, but in bits and pieces. How many can say praise God for that? All right. He then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it. He dug a pit for the wine press and he built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and they went away on a journey. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect uh, some from some of them the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, they beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, and others they killed. Point number one is this. They rejected the rejected stone will judge. The rejected stone will judge. So keep your eye on Jesus. The stone that they rejected turns around and becomes the judge. The meaning of the parable is how a misfit person in the end has found its rightful place. Our rejection because of Jesus' righteousness leads to a significance it leads to significance in God's redemptive plan. He had left them Verse 6 says, And sent a son whom he loved. And he sent him last of all, saying, They will respect the son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and they killed him and they threw him out of the vineyard. To reject Jesus is to reject the kingdom of God. 1 Peter 2, 7 says, The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message. There's something about Jesus that is precious to us who are believers. How many would say Jesus is precious to me? Amen. Amen. And I haven't even had a chance. It's so good to see Trent here. Amen. After getting a nasty spider bite and... Uh, but uh, he told me on the phone, but I never got a chance to, and to talk to him about it. But uh, he went up and talked to God during his surgery. And I hope, Trent, you don't mind me telling him, but one of these days, you're going to have to explain that to all of us. Yes, pass. <laughs> but the thing is that I got from my conversation is not only is Jesus precious to us, but we're precious to him. Yeah. We're precious to him. But this whole thing about Jesus was a stumbling block to everybody. Every, nobody could, you know, to the Jews. They just couldn't, they just, this guy from Nazareth, this itinerant rabbi is, is the Messiah? No way. Why? Because they, he was from the common person, and they they he threatened them. All who did not receive Christ as Savior will one day face him as judge because of the sin. All disobedient unbelievers are destined for a stumbling which will lead to eternal condemnation. Verse 9 says. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyards to others. Haven't you read the scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And what the Lord has done, it is marvelous in our eyes. Uh, the, the Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. I want you to read that last phrase with me. Read it out loud with me. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Some translations use wonderful. Given to a people who will appear, uh, who will bear appropriate fruit. 
They rejected, rejected Jesus as the Messiah, the chief priests, the teachers, and the law, and the elders. But because and becomes, and, but he becomes the foundation, the cornerstone, the capstone of the church. Later, God will once again turn his attention to the sons of Jacob, and all Israel will be saved. Romans eleven twenty five through twenty seven, excuse me twenty seven, and and until when the full numbers Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles come in and all and so all Israel will be saved as is written the deliverer will come from Zion he will turn godliness away from Jacob and this is my covenant with them and I and I will take their sins away their sins. God overrules in amazing ways rebellious human attempts to block his purposes. I want you to, to get a hold of that. Sometimes you look and you, like the, the other day, I'm, true confessions here, all right? I'm, con, I'm confessing my sin. Is everybody ready for this? Now, I know some of you think I was perfect. No. But don't, don't tell my, my, don't ask my wife, all right? She'll give you the truth. But... So I'm out mowing my lawn, and as I'm mowing my lawn, I start thinking about, about a certain governor that is running in a certain state, and uh, he has come out and said that he's going to make abortion his number one issue. And, uh, you know, we support, uh, you know, the crisis pregnancy places, now they call them just pregnancy centers, you know, the alternative to Planned Parenthood. But he has come out and vowed that he's going to shut every one of them down. And I, and I started thinking about that. And I go, God, you know, is there any way to stop this guy? Is there any way to stop him? Because I do not want this guy to become governor. Do you understand what I'm saying? But here's what, here's what I found as I'm studying this passage is this. Is that God can overrule the rebellious people. Because here's all these rebellious people who were in Israel. The common people that had come, in, come into town from, from, uh, from Galilee and stuff. They were going, Jesus, he's the Messiah. Hosanna, Hosanna, save us. And then you have all these people that were in Jerusalem, the big city. And they were going, we hate this guy. We can't wait until we kill him. But God has a plan to take the stone the builder rejected and make it what? The capstone, the cornerstone, the keystone. And I, so I have to repent right now. I turn that governor over to the Lord because his ways are marvelous. He has a way to turn a defeat into a victory. Then they looked for a way to arrest him. Verse 12. Because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. And they were afraid of the crowd. So they left him and went away. They started planning how they might kill him. They knew that all the people that were there in town for the holidays, for the Passover. That there is, it wasn't anything that they could do because they would, they would cause a riot. But they started scheming how they might kill Jesus at that point. And they continued to do it. They had been doing it up to that point. What do I need to do? Verse 13 says, Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians. That was an odd thing. It was like uh, sending uh, the Republicans, the, the staunchest Republicans, with, uh, you know, the most... Uh, you know, people that are vested in the government, the Herodians, these are, these are the people that were in the, in the administration of government, to Jesus to catch him in his words. And they came to him and they said, notice these are two polar opposites, the Pharisees and the Herodians. Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity, that you aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who, uh, who they are. In other words, Jesus was not swayed by people's opinions. That's the way we need to be, is we need to not be, we need to get over the fear of man and stop being afraid of what people will think about us. Can I get an amen? amen. 
But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And it is right, is it right to pay our taxes to Caesar or not? Or shouldn't, or, or should we pay, or should we pay, or shouldn't we? Number two <coughs> is this, honor, know, and love. Because Jesus exposes the religious. Here we have the liberals and we have the conservatives. But they had one thing in common. They wanted to get rid of Jesus. He was a threat to their positions of power over the people and with Rome. And they put him in a situation. They said, well, all right. So they, they, they put him in a, in a, in a catch-22 is what they were trying to do. They're saying, okay, if it's right to pay uh, taxes, then all the people will get upset because they don't like to pay taxes. But if he, if he comes out and he says, you know, yes, you should pay all this money to the Rome. That uh, to the Romans, uh, or if he said no, you don't, you don't need to pay your taxes. What would the Romans do? They would say he would he would be on the bad side of the Romans. Mm -hmm. So notice what Jesus does. But Jesus knew their what hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked them. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought the coin and they asked him, whose portrait is on and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said, here's the pithy statement, give to Caesar what is what? Caesar's. And to God what is God's. They were amazed at him. Give honor to whom honor is due. Pay your taxes. Taxes is not a gift um, taxes are not a gift to the government, but it, uh, somebody said a debt for service is rendered. Um, I just have a little trouble with the way they spend our tax money. <laughs> but we are made not in Caesar's image, but we are made in the image of God. And we must pay back to God the things that are God's. First Peter 12, uh, 13 through 17. I'm just going to read the last part of it. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God and honor the kings. Then verse 18. Then the Sadducees who say there's no resurrection. Here's another catch 22. They, they came to him with a question. Teacher! They said, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. And now where there were seven brothers, the first one married and died leaving, uh, leaving uh, without leaving any children. The second one married and the widow, but he also died leaving no children. And in the same way, the third, and in fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? And Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? Then the dead rise and there will neither they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the bush how God said to them, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. God knows, know God's word, and know God's power. C.S. Lewis said that every one of us have a hole in a heart that only God can fulfill. Know the scriptures. Know the scriptures. Fallen angels crave intimacy. Uh, I don't, probably what happened is many of the demonic spirits that we face are probably uh, the spirits of the Nephilim, I think. Changed my thinking over this. And uh, there are fallen angels. There's, there's the fallen holy ones. But the thing is, is why, 
Have you ever thought about this? Why does a spirit want to come into somebody and possess them? Why is that? Because they desire intimacy. They want to come in and possess somebody because they want to have intimacy because they've been separated from God. Know the power of God. We do not cease to exist after we die, but we live on. God transcends the time, and He is God now and in eternity over, uh, uh, as, uh, over us as we are a spirit having bodily experiences, a body experience. We are a spirit having a body experience. Over us as a spirit alone and in eternity with a glorified body united with our spirit, His power still makes Him God over all. Here's the two things. Know the power of God. You, when you die, that is not the end of you. You will continue on. How many know that's true? Either we're going to go into the presence of God, because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? So, but the other thing is, is some of you, I used to think, and this, this always bothered me when I read this scripture before I got married. I said, God, I want to get married. I want to have kids. I want to, I want to experience intimacy with a wife. But you know what happened was I found out is this, is that what Jesus was saying is that, you know, when we die and when we are resurrected or when we go to heaven, we're not going to have to worry about who, who am I going to marry in heaven? Because that intimacy that we so crave can be satisfied here with Jesus, but it will ultimately be satisfied when we're in God's presence. There will be something that will be far greater than any, than any experience that we could ever have in marriage. How many can say praise God for that? <laughs> Reading on, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating and noticed that Jesus had given them a good answer. And he asked him, of all the commandments, which is most important? The most important one answered Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Here's another controversy story where they're trying to, trying to catch Jesus. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is the one and there is no one, uh, there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Then Jesus saw that he had answered wisely and he said to him, you are not far off from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. The third point under this is love God, then you can love your neighbor. If you can love God, here's, here's the thing about discipleship. And it, this, this, the passage, the, the parallel passage in Matthew, I think it's, it's like Matthew 24, 22 or something. But, but there's discipleship is not about learning something, but it's about having a relationship with God and knowing God's word and then being able to apply it in that sense. In other words, to, you, to know God and to love your neighbor. You can't, you, if, if, you, 
if you know God's word and how to apply that, if you love God and God loves you, then you can love your neighbor. When I was out mowing my lawn, I wasn't loving God very much and I wasn't loving what was going on in my mind until I got back and got right with God and started loving God. Then I could finally say, you know, Lord, forgive me. You deal with this guy. Do you understand what I'm saying? If I hate a fellow believer, then you can't go to heaven. Note all the commandments are given to help us love God and to love others. What do I need to know? What do I need to think about these things? Point number three is blessed, blessed to be a blessing because Jesus exalts the faithful. Verse 35, while Jesus was sitting in the temple courts, he asked, How is it that the teachers of the law say that the Christ is the Son of God? David himself is speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, and I will put my enemies under your feet. And David himself calls him, Lord, how can uh, he be uh, his son? The large crowd listened with him to delight. Let me read that last part there. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put my enemies under your feet. And David himself calls him Lord. How can he, how can he be his son? The Messiah, the Lord and Savior, who is the Christ, Jesus, David's son, is master at the same time. He is David's son and master at the same time. David was the national hero and the deliverer. On one hand, Jesus, the son of David. The title is used of the story of the blind Bartimaeus. Son of David, have mercy on me. And in the triumphal entry, Jesus is the savior on the of the savior of the world. <coughs> Excuse me. On the other hand, the reader knows that Jesus is Lord by virtue of his identity as the son of God. Jesus is explaining how this is possible. And verse 38, and he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplace and have the most important seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widowers house, widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. Verses 38 and 40, the elite desire men's praises and abuse privileges this is what was going on in jerusalem the elite of, of jerusalem they desired the praises of men and they abused their privileges the dangers of elitism is lust for prominence false piety and cruel avarice teachers held are held to a higher standard if they if they go uh if they go to the hardware store and they change it, it into a suit and tie uh, so people will uh, recognize them as a minister. Uh, my dad had a friend that was a pastor and he would be working around the house or something. And this was years ago. But, but you know, when he went to the hardware store, well, he, he went in, he took his work clothes off. He got his three-piece suit on and then went to buy some butt bolts and <laughs> bolts and nuts at the hardware store. Why why would you do something like that? They they love these the elite, they they desire for men's praise and they abuse their privileges. We don't want to get into that position where we just think we're above everybody else and we take advantage of people. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Let me go on. Jesus sat in the opposite place where the offerings, this is verse 41, offering plates and watched the crowds putting their money into the temple treasury. 
Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples together to, to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more in the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty. Uh, put in everything, all that she had to live on. The extravagant giver increases faith through giving. The widow's offering, the widow's might. Blessed to be a blessing. There is something, um, there is something that what God wants. I, I, I know when Alan Clevenger was here, he talked about uh, putting the burden on God. How many remember him, he, where he kept saying that? He kept putting the burden on God. What does that mean to put a burden on God? It's like this. is like when um, Rod Loy, a uh, pastor down in Arkansas, a few years ago we heard him testify in a, and gave a testimony at, at one of our minister's conferences. And he talked about how that his wife had um, cancer. And, uh, and it had gone into remission, and then it came back. And the second time that it came back, they decided that what they were going to do was they were not going to tell anybody. They weren't going to tell a soul, but they were just going to pray. So he upped his prayer life, and then what he also did was he, he upped his offerings. And he started giving more to the Lord. And what he, why did he do that? Because he put him in a place where he said, God, I cannot heal my wife and I am counting on you to do something. It's in the same way as like when, when, when uh, uh, James talks about um, faith without works is what? Yes. Dead. If, if, you, if you put the burden on God... What Alan Clevenger was meant is that you put God in a position where he has to act. Amen? Where he has to act. And how, how does that... So, I mean, the, 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 great, the, the experience that I had in my life was when I came to a point where um, Janice and I got... We felt like God was telling us to leave Sacramento and... Uh, and we had applied for another church and they seemed to be stalemated for months on end. And I remember the phone call like it was yesterday. I had called a mentor of mine, um, Pastor Cole, and I remember I was playing, praying in the sanctuary and as I was praying, and I was struggling with what I was going through. And uh, because I, I felt like a, a call and I didn't know how to break the stalemate, and when I started to talk to Pastor Cole, he, he said something that just totally shocked me. He said, well, I found out that if you resign your church here, he will open the door on the other end. And I said, you got to be nuts. <laughs> I didn't say that out loud, but I thought it. I said, you got to be absolutely nuts. And then I thought, well, okay. Either one thing is, God is God or he's not. When that widow came and she had her might, that was all the money that she had. She takes it and she puts it in the offering box. What is she saying? She's saying, God, you are God and my source is not me, but it's you. And I am putting you to the test. Here it is. God measures giving not by the amount, but by the love, devotion, and sacrifice represented in the gift. I uh, blessed to be a blessing. God wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing. 
God wants to make you, uh, uh, as you are faithful and generous in giving to Him and His work, He will bless you to be a blessing. You are blessed to be a blessing. There are missionaries that need support. There are ministries that need support. Uh, there, are, there are ministries here in town that need support. Don't you think that God wants to, to bless us so that we might bless them? Amen? And He wants to make you a channel in which to flow funds and resources through. Just want to close with this. Three things to remember. <clears throat> the rejected has become the judge. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Honor, know, and love. Give honor to the, to whom honor is due. Know God's word. Know God's power. Love God, then you can love your neighbor. And bless to be a blessing. Take your Bibles. I want to close this with one thought. The passage. Take your Bible and turn to Psalms 118. And as I was getting ready this morning, I thought about this. And, and I felt like the Lord just give a word to you today. And the word was, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Have faith, beloved. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. How many, how many have, have said that song and even sang that song? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and let us be glad in it. Well, here's, here's the deal. I didn't notice this until today. Um, the stone that the builder rejected. Let me read it out of the King James. Psalm 118, 22. Psalm 118, verse 22, reading now the New King James Version. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And this was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. What I want to say to you is be of good cheer. Have faith. Believe in God. Believe God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Jesus was rejected. But God did a marvelous thing. It, if you were there and you saw all these oppositions against Jesus. And then, then you saw that he got, he got crucified on the cross. And those three days when he was in the tomb. You were in Bummersville. If you were a disciple, weren't you? But all of a sudden, Jesus came out. And Jesus was resurrected. And that same Jesus that they, re that they rejected is going to be judge of all. Is that true? This is the day that the Lord has made. The Lord has done something marvelous. The Lord has done something wonderful. And I'm here to tell you, that this is the day that the Lord has made. Do you believe that God made this day? Amen. And I, what I want you to know is that God is working behind the scenes to do something marvelous that you don't even know about. God is doing something marvelous, something wonderful that you don't even know about. In the same way, what God did for Jesus and turned him from being rejected to being judge. Can he do that for you? Amen. 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 This is the day the Lord has made. The day Yahweh has worked. Rejoice and be glad. Because the Lord God Almighty is working. The day... He is working the day. So the stone the builder rejected is now the cornerstone. 
God is working behind the scenes. God is working behind the scenes. God is working behind the scenes. And he is going to make something wonderful happen. What I want to do here is, is that um, the, Jesus said, the Bible says that my house should be a house of what? Prayer. Prayer. I want to close this day off, this morning, with prayer. I want to close it with prayer. And I want to pray for you.